Well, good morning, men. We're going to get started here in a few minutes. But before we do, I wanted to uh, make an announcement that uh, my new book, uh, How God Makes Men, uh, came out this week on November 5th. And so I uh, wanted to uh, let you know a little bit about that. So when I travel and meet a stranger, they will often say something like, you work with men, that must really be hard. And I just hold up my hand and I tell them, you got the wrong guy. I have the best job in the world. We constantly see men coming to Christ and growing in their faith. Uh, all of that said, though, we need to do a reality check because, you know, men today in our culture under, are under severe attack. We live in a pop culture that ridicules men in general, Christian men in particular. And so a lot of men are really confused about what biblical manhood really looks like. So I, I wanted to write this book and include the 10 epic stories that I uh, really love. Uh, and so uh, the people that are included in this book uh, are men like Abraham. So no man has ever had their faith tested more than Abraham. No man has ever felt mistreated more than Joseph. No man has ever felt more abandoned by God than Moses. Maybe some of you feel that way. Uh, no man has ever felt less qualified to be a leader than Gideon. No man has ever tried harder to find happiness without God than Solomon. Uh, no man has ever sinned more egregiously than David. Hopefully you can relate to some of these. No man has ever wanted his life to really make a difference uh, more than Nehemiah. No man has ever suffered more than Job. No man has ever known more about making disciples than Peter, and no man has ever know more about how to follow and to serve Jesus than Paul. And so these are the men that I've included in this book. Wanted to make you aware of this. Hope you'll get a copy. Hope you enjoy it. And now we'll get started with the study. Good morning, men. We have a dozen area directors in town this week going through boot camp. This is the last phase of their training before they are activated and actually begin working with churches. And it's a very exciting time for them and for us here because everything that's happening at Man in the Mirror is really an outgrowth of this Bible study, always has been. This has been the Petri dish. This has been the laboratory where the scientists have been conducting their experiments. And so uh, these really are men that belong to you as much as to the kingdom. And so uh, what I'd like to do uh, is just ask each of the area directors, if you would, just uh, stand. And then let's give them a big rousing uh, congratulations. <laughs> It is very exciting. These men will basically be covered up with churches who want to be more effective in discipling men. Uh, that's what we found so far, is that uh, uh, as many problems as there are in this country, one problem we don't have is whether or not churches want to figure out how to disciple men, uh, they, because they really do. And so uh, uh, congratulations to all of you area directors. So um, let's do a shout out. We're going to do a shout out. We've got, uh, this is kind of fun. Uh, we've got a group in, uh, in uh, Gary, Indiana, at the Washington Street Church of God. Uh, Robert Dotson is the leader. And uh, there are three guys. They're meeting on Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. doing the video Bible study with us. And uh, I think they're sort of uh, in the early stages of this. And so we want to encourage you men, uh, Robert and you other two guys. And so would you uh, join me in giving them a, a warm welcome to the Bible study. One, two, three, hoorah! Welcome, guys. Glad to have you with us. All right, and so uh, the series is Hanging Out with uh, Jesus. And today we uh, look at a question about taxes. Okay, so it's Tuesday. Jesus is going to be crucified on Friday, and Tuesday is the day he's overwhelmed with all kinds of questions from religious leaders uh, who essentially are trying to trap him. And so 
first, let's look at what's going on. Let's look at the text together. Uh, the, the question you'll see is about taxes. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that the, the bigger and perhaps more relevant question that does get addressed here is, what is the duty of a Christian to his country and to his community? What is your duty as a Christian to your country and to your community? And so, we're going to be looking today for a principle by which you can make secular decisions that also honor God. What is there, what is the principle, by, is there a principle by which we can make secular decisions that also honor God? And this is so relevant because of all of the different ways that people go once they become a Christian. One of the saddest, saddest things I've ever seen in my life was a uh, university professor who uh, was a friend of mine. He became a Christian, and his understanding of what it meant to be to be a Christian in the world was that basically the world was evil. Uh, the world is, in its present form, is passing away. The world is evil. Uh, and so his re response was to withdraw. And so he, he made a, 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 a determined and long-term commitment to become very mediocre at his work as a professor, just sort of hanging on and to, to disengage uh, to retire as early as possible, and that's why I've lost track of him, because he basically decided to retire and completely withdraw from, from, from the world to, to have no impact on the world because the world in its present form is passing away. And so uh, the title of this talk today is The Dual Citizenship of a Christian, The Dual Citizenship of a Christian. And so we're going to see that, that Jesus does have a principle by which we can make secular decisions that also honor God. Verse 15, Matthew 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? All right, so this is the backdrop. This is the backdrop. What's going on here? What's going on here? Well, they are laying a, a trap. This is a, a hypocrisy. This, this, these praises here, this is disingenuous praise. This is flattery. The, the Herodians were a secular political party, and the Pharisees are a religious party, and they have very different views. The Herodians uh, embraced the, the occupation and the rule of the Romans, but the Pharisees and the it, it, appealing back to a, a theocratic kind of a government, um, felt like this was foreign dom domination, and, uh, and they felt repressed by the Romans. So you have, basically, you have Republicans and Democrats, okay? You have two parties here with two very different views. And as the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Jesus is their mutual enemy, and so they become friends. And they decide to set a trap. And so they send the disciples of the Pharisees, not the Pharisees themselves, and then these Herodians. And they set this, this, this trap. And so they, the question is, should you pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, what's the dilemma? What is the dilemma that Jesus faces? Well, what happens if he answers uh, yes? Well, if he answers yes... Then he loses the support of the popular masses in Israel who do feel dominated by the Roman occupation. And if he says uh, no, then he's guilty of sedition 
and then he becomes the enemy of, of the Romans. So they're trying to trap him. You know, it's a lot like the, the questions today. You know, you, you probably have had people try to ask you trick questions, you know, like, can God make a rock that's too heavy for him to lift? You've heard that one, right? <laughs> or if God is omnipotent, shouldn't he be able to create a being more powerful than himself? Or uh, can God make a square circle? You know, these are the kinds of illogical questions that, that, that people come up with. And so this, is, this, this question in the mind of Jesus falls somewhat in that, that category. And so um, I, th- I think that perhaps that's all for the the backdrop, let's now look at the wisdom of Jesus and the way he answers, beginning in verse 18. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, and so just to be very clear, um, it is a trap, it is hypocrisy, it was evil in intent. Uh, it's, it's like two parties getting together, we may say Republicans and Democrats getting together, and, uh, you know, Politics make strange bedfellows, and then, but they, they, they get together so that they can trap, say, uh, an independently elected president. So that would be the kind of idea going on here. Knowing their evil intent, he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. So if, uh, if somebody were to ask you, uh, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not, what would you say? Well, I, I know what I'd say. I'd say, I don't know. <laughs> And uh, what would you do if you were Solomon? Well, you might say, well, uh, show me the denarius. And then he'd say, okay, cut the denarius in two and give half to Caesar and half to God, right? But, but look at what Jesus says. He just says, whose inscription do you see on that thing? And, uh, and so he says, well, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And they had no answer. The wisdom of Jesus and so, so Jesus is showing a, a, a third way. In, in, in essence, in the kingdom of God, uh, taking care of creation, um, tending the culture, and building the kingdom are like two sides of the same coin, all right? You can't separate them. You can't put, you cannot put half of a coin into a vending machine. You have to put the whole thing in. And so you can't separate these things in the mind of God. So in what Jesus is doing here is, is he is establishing that we have a dual citizenship. And, and he's also establishing that it is a good thing to be a great Christian. Uh, it is a good thing to be a great citizen. Jesus is establishing here that it's a good thing to be a great citizen. And so uh, let's just work with this today is the big idea. Precisely because we are Christians, we should become great citizens. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be withdrawing from culture, uh, trying to retire as early as we can and do as little as we possibly can. Quite the contrary. Uh, Jesus gives us a, a principle here by which we can make secular decisions that honor God, and that is the principle of dual citizenship. Now, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, 57. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 7. So, the, the uh, Israelites in captivity in Babylon, and this is the instruction, Jeremiah 29, verse 7, given through Jeremiah to the exiles. He says, Seek the peace and prosperity 
of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. This, this is the idea of why we become great citizens, because God wants us to become great citizens, wherever you are. Now, you are not in exile uh, in, in, in the United States, you, because you have freedom of religion. There are, there are men who will be uh, uh, watching this uh, Bible study who live in repressed nations, where this is, this is the case. They are a, uh, a people in exile. But in any event, this is the principle that uh, stands behind our dual citizenship and why we really need to become great citizens. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's so important because Christianity is, is the hope of creation. It is the hope of culture. Now, it is the thing that stabilizes civilizations. How do men become civilized? By becoming disciples of Jesus. How do men stay uncivilized? They don't become disciples of Jesus. It's, it, is, it is through this idea of our witness in the world that men see something that is so attractive to them that they, are, they want to be part of that and their hearts become transformed by the gospel. So that won't happen if you don't lead an exemplary life of a citizen. So if, if what it means to be a Christian means to be a slob, not take care of yourself, if what it means to be a Christian means to always be late paying your bills or not paying your bills, if what it means to be a Christian is to dump your wife when you uh, feel like, you know, you want to get a new model, if what it means to be a Christian is to cheat on your taxes, uh, cut corners at work, then I don't want to be one. That's, that's what happens. That's what happens. So that's why it's important for those of us who are Christians to be great citizens because this is the way that God is redeeming the world. Uh, now, he is sovereignly redeeming the world, and if you are a slob, and if you don't pay your taxes, and if you cheat on your business expenses, and if you cut corners, that doesn't mean that he's going to allow anyone to go to hell because of you. But you won't be part of it. But you won't be part of it. So, let's take a look next at this principle of dual citizenship a little deeper, and Turn with me to Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Romans 13, verse 1. And since Jesus is dealing specifically here with taxes, I thought we should probably cover that part of the dual citizenship uh, first. So, Jesus Christ is alive, and he reveals himself through citizens of earth who are citizens of God. Romans 13, 1, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, even the evil ones. All right, now we're going to talk about evil ones here a little bit too. But even, even the evil authorities were established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you, for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. And that would be uh, law enforcement, the rule of law, the ability to send you for jail, to jail for not paying taxes, for example. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. 
And so uh, I watched another episode of Beyond Scared Straight last night. Man, I'm telling you, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they, they do have a, uh, a sword with which they can bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is why, also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give them full time, uh, they're full time to governing. Give, give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, revenue. If respect, respect and honor, then honor. So that, that is the, 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 the text that governs our relationship with our government, with our government. And, <clears throat> and so we can look, uh, look to the example of Jesus to see how this works. Jesus did not come as a political agitator. Are you a political agitator? Jesus did not come as a political revolutionary. Jesus did not come to overthrow culture. In fact, if anything, Jesus shows us that Christianity is lived inside cultures. He didn't come to abolish the uh, injustices of the Roman government, but to show us how to correct the injustices inside the Roman rule, to submit to those authorities. You think the Romans were a righteous government? There were many good things about the Roman government, but uh, all, uh, a lot of the ills that we have today, you would have found in their government too. And Jesus did not come to overthrow the government. Jesus came to install the kingdom of heaven, which would prevail. So, you know, the, the, the deal is, is that we're, we're, the, the eternal kingdom of Christ is lodged in temporary housing. The eternal kingdom of Christ is lodged in temporary housing. The earth is temporary housing. The earth is like heaven's womb, uh, where we are all in gestation, you see. This is temporary housing. I've said before that, that, that the whole creation is in escrow. We're under contract. We've been purchased by the blood of Christ. The deposit has been made, and we're waiting for the closing. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean we are inactive while we are waiting for this eternal kingdom of Christ. This temporary housing is extremely important to God. In fact, God gives us four purposes in the Bible, loving God, loving our neighbors, the Great Commission, and the cultural mandate, taking care of creation. So this is very much part, and, and the reason it's so important is because of the witness, the witness that it gives to those. So God, God is patient, <coughs> not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. He has delayed the closing, and he's delayed the closing, and he's delayed the closing. Now, I don't know if he's delayed it multiple times or we just misunderstood when the original closing was supposed to take place. But anyway, the point is, is that we're under a delayed closing scenario. And the reason we're under a declared, declared uh, uh, delayed, uh, whatever, is because God, <laughs> is because God wants to bring as many people into the deal as he can as many people into the deal as he can. And he's doing that. And he's doing that in phenomenal ways. I mean, the, do you realize, I mean, there's so many millions more Christians just in our country in the United States uh, be, because God was gracious to delay his closing. Millions and millions of people have become Christians. So it's this principle of dual citizenship. And we have this example that Jesus set. There are other examples of how you live out the dual citizenship. You have Joseph, who, who uh, became the prime minister of Egypt. What's the, modern, what's the modern day country that represents Egypt in the Old Testament? <laughs> and then you have... Uh, then you have... Um, in, uh, in uh, Babylon, you have Daniel. He rises to be the, the number two man in, in Babylon. 
And uh, the country that corresponds to ancient Babylon today is what? Iraq. Sodom Hussein's summer palace overlooked the ruins of Babylon. So uh, imagine today being a Christian, the number two person in the nation of Iraq. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? That would be a good thing. Yeah, because, you see, precisely because we are Christian, we ought to become great citizens, citizens that, that even the secularists want to give um, respect to, honor to, position to. And then, uh, who else do we have? Um, Mordecai. Mordecai in ancient Persia. Uh, the capital, Susa, of Persia is modern-day what? Iran. So imagine that the number two person today, the number two leader in Iran today is a Christian. Would that be a good thing? You bet. So you see that, that God is very much into uh, this idea of having a dual citizenship so that we can take care of creation on his behalf. Now, there are exceptions. So the Hebrew midwives. When the Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives to, to kill all the, the boys as they're uh, born, what did, what did they do? They disobeyed. They disobeyed the government. Why did they do that? Because the taking of life, the aborting, uh, the live birth abortions of these children was completely immoral. And so, precisely because we are Christians, we must become great citizens. So there's another side to this too, and that is, is, is to not do the, not, not condone, not uh, participate in, in e when governments do evil. So certainly this whole abortion issue even today, of course, is a very big thing. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and, uh, I think it's Peter and John, are arrested and brought before the, the ruling council. And they're, they're told to no longer speak and, and preach in the name of Jesus. And what did they say? What did they say? We can't do that. We must, we must obey God, not man. And so today, everywhere uh, uh, many places you go, uh, you, you see because we, we, we do live in an increasingly secularized culture that one that is grinding the, the, the moral consensus that used to exist, the Christian, Judeo-Christian value, grinding it out of our culture. And so uh, using the name of Jesus now, uh, praying in the name of Jesus in many venues is, is frowned upon. But you should do it anyway. You should just do it anyway. Now, be respectful. Don't be uh, combative. Don't try to be an agi a political agitator. But I'll just give you one example. I got invited, you know, uh, 2008 to do the uh, um, invocation for the Orange County Commission. And so I uh, didn't bring it. But anyway, I, I gave a, a two-minute civil prayer. And at the end, I, I closed the prayer. I said, uh, with respect for men and women of all faiths and religions, I make this prayer in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see? And so I, I was faithful to be a, I was trying to be a great citizen, not, not, a, not, a, not a religious agitator. I did, you know, you can offend, <laughs> you could do just, you could probably do more offense by being, trying to be a great Christian. Uh, <laughs> Just try to be a great citizen doing what Christians do. And then another exception that I just thought about a little earlier is uh, the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so King Nebuchadnezzar built this giant statue to himself and, and demanded that everybody bow down and worship this statue of him. But they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. And this is so much fun. And... Uh, 
Yeah, I think we got time. Turn to Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 3. I just, I want you to read it for yourself. It's just, I love, you love this too. I know you love this if you are familiar with it. And if you're not, you're going to love it. It's just great. Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Verse 16, so the king says, but if you don't worship the statue, you're going to be thrown into a blazing furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from that? And then in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. (laughs) And then then that made him so mad. I guess he turned up the heat even more. And, And they were rescued by God, as you may know the story. And so, so, uh, with regard to like, if the nation is going in the way of abortion, you may you 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 have a, a precedent for civil disobedience. If you are told that you can't uh, save the name of Jesus, you have a precedent uh, for civil disobedience. If you're told to uh, you must worship another god, you have a precedent for civil disobedience. Now, for an American, this isn't uh, this last one is not necessarily a big deal, but uh, it is a big deal if you. Uh, live in certain foreign countries. The big idea here today is precisely because we are Christians, we must be great citizens. You know why I didn't declare bankruptcy when I went through my business crisis back in the, uh, in, in the 80s? I'll tell you why I didn't. Because I understood the principle of, of dual citizenship. Uh, uh, I was a developer, real estate developer. Everybody, all my peers that were real estate developers, all of them did go through bankruptcy. And there's, and, uh, and uh, bankruptcy is not a, um, it, it, it is, it is a, uh, a disgrace at one level, but it's not from one from which you can't, Recover, and we have bankruptcy laws in the uh, in the law for a uh, for a reason to give people relief. But I had been such an out loud Christian in this town that I sensed that God was calling me, and He might not call you to do what I did, but He was calling me to do everything humanly possible to not go bankrupt. Uh, and I never had any sense that he was going to deliver me. I never had that. For seven years, I woke up every day not knowing if that was the day that uh, somebody was going to force me or try to force me into bankruptcy. But every day I woke up and I, and I sensed that God was giving me strength to try to be a great citizen, to try to set an example. And so it took seven years uh, to, to work through all those problems, but I was able to uh, with God's help I, and God's grace, I was able to do it. Because, but but the, the thing that kept me going was the understanding of this principle of dual citizenship. That I'm not just a citizen of the kingdom of heaven uh, sitting here treading water waiting, waiting for the rapture. That he wants me to engage. He wants me to be a witness. He wants you to be a witness. And then just last, now what? Now what for you? Now what for me? Well, first of all, Give to God what belongs to God. Isn't that what the text says? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. What what belongs to God? Give him your soul. Give him your heart. Give him your love. Give him your trust. Give him your obedience. Give him your spiritual worship of of service. Give the things to God that God is doing. And then, what do you give to Caesar? What do you give to Caesar? Well, think about it. Just think about it. First of all, we've seen today you should submit to the laws of your country. We've seen today that you should pay taxes. You you shouldn't pay any more taxes than than is required. And uh, if you you have 
enough taxes to pay that you can afford to get some tax counsel to pay less taxes, then that's smart. I do that. You should do that. But to pay the, the proper amount of taxes. If, if, uh, if you, uh, because, because you are a Christian and because you should be a great citizen, you should pay your bills on time. And you should pay your bills. And you should do your work with excellence. And you should pay honest wages if you happen to be the employer. If you're good enough to be a CEO, be a great CEO. If you're good enough to be an outstanding auto mechanic, be a fantastic one. If you're good enough to, to, to be whatever, do a top salesman, be an excellent salesman. And do it for the glory of God because of this dual citizenship. Precisely because we are Christians, we must become great citizens. We had a man come here once and speak. He was from Africa. He told us a story that he moved with his family to a small village. They felt called to move to a small village where the uh, yards were unkempt, there was trash in the streets, a uh, terrible kind of place. And he told his family, because we are Christians, we must have a beautiful home. And so they planted grass and flowers in the yard, and they painted and they refurbished the home, and they uh, picked up the trash in the streets around them. One of the neighbors came and said, uh, why are you doing this? And he said, we are doing this because it is our duty to Christ. And then that gave him an opportunity to witness. And then after a while, another neighbor, seeing the example they had set, uh, fixed up their house, and then another, and then another, until the entire community was transformed because he understood precisely because we are Christians, we must also become great citizens. Let us pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, certainly, Lord, uh, my prayer has been that nobody needed this message. And yet, uh, common sense says that somebody needed this message. And uh, Lord, only you and they know who. And uh, hopefully, they're aware that they know who they are. But Father, just help each of us to figure out, because this is, there is no single one way to do this, uh, but, but the way that we are to do this is we really are to engage. We are not to withdraw. We're not to try to overthrow, and we're certainly not to assimilate. We are to engage this goal. Show each of us, Lord, how you would have us respond. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.